Hey everybody, welcome back to the REI Marketing Secrets Podcast. Today on the show, we have Brian Burke. Brian is the president and CEO of of Praxis Capital, a vertically integrated real estate private equity investment firm, which he founded in 2001. Brian has acquired over $800 million worth of real estate over a 30 year career, including over 4,000 multifamily units and more than 700 single family homes with the assistance of proprietary software that he wrote himself. Brian has also subdivided land, built homes, and constructed self-storage, but he really prefers to reposition existing multifamily properties. Additionally, he is also the author of The Hands-Off Investor and is a frequent public speaker at real estate conferences and events nationwide. Brian, super excited to have you on the show today. Thanks, Trevor. I'm excited to be here. And Brian, going back to say, you know, in your early years, like, why did you decide to say, hey, I want to start investing in real estate? You know, if you could think back 20, you know, 30 years, what did, you know, what got you into the game all the way back then? Well, I think it was a combination of two things. One is what choice did I have? I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really have a lot of skills in doing much of, uh, of anything. Of course, when I started, I was 20 years old, you know, just not too long out of high school. And uh, I think my first business was selling pomegranates on a card table on the intersection by my grandmother's house that were grown on her tree in the front yard. So I I guess I figured I had to be in some kind of a business. And from everything I had heard and read in in all the books and, and everything else was that real estate was the way that most wealth was made. So I figured that sounds good to me. I'll start investing in real estate. And uh, I made my first real estate investment when I was 20 and um, it was a terrible experience. So I was therefore hooked. So do you mind, uh, yeah, what, what happened with that first experience? Was it uh, the tenants? Was it the termites? Was it the toilets? Which, uh, which one of those was it? <laughs> oh, it was every one of those things, believe me. Yeah, it, it, it was everything. Everything that could go wrong, of course, went wrong. And, uh, and at the end of the day, when I finally sold that property, it was a, I, I had it as a rental for a couple of years. And when I finally sold it, I, I think I either broke even or maybe had like I don't know, a few hundred dollars loss or a few hundred dollars profit. I mean, it was certainly wasn't worth the effort, but it was a really, really incredible opportunity to learn uh, a lot about what I didn't know and um, learn about uh, how difficult the business is so that I don't take it um, uh, too lax a days ago. I had to take it, I had to take it seriously if I was going to be successful. And that was a good time to learn that. So, you know, now that you, you know, you got your start into real estate, you know, deal, maybe the first deal didn't go out as good as you wanted, but you know, you got your teeth into it. You know, you, as I say, the first deal is always the hardest. And then now, you know, as you've been building your company, you know, why multifamily, why multifamily over, you know, mobile home parks, over self storage, over, you know, the hot thing of short term rentals, you know, midterm rentals, you know, Mm -hmm. why, you know, why did you decide to go with, you know, multifamily and build your company around that? Because over the years, I've had the good fortune of acquiring almost a billion dollars in real estate. It's like almost, I'm coming up on almost 800 properties. And in amongst that, I've done almost all of those things that you mentioned. And what I found is that I was best at multifamily. You know, I would have all kinds of challenges that were steep obstacles when I tried to stray off the path into some other kind of asset class like hospitality and vacant land and development. And, you know, some went well and some maybe not as well, but they were all very difficult and challenging and and seemed like they took forever. Yet multifamily has been one that despite the fact that, of course, it has its challenges and um, we've had our, our deals that struggle like everybody else. Uh, that produced much better results for me and for our investors uh, for every unit of risk and for every unit of time. And uh, I've just found that that's what we're really good at. And you might as well stick to what you found you're best at and just stay that course. Yeah. And I think that's a good example. I find that, you know, sometimes you might see an operator where they go into multifamily and then the next year they might be in an RV park and then the next year they might be in, you know, a laundry, you know, laundromat space. And to me, it's like, you know, how much am I going to trust this operator where, you know, someone like yourself, they've been in the business over 20 years, you know, you rode through 08 and obviously more recently, you know, in the last year or so, you know, you've seen a lot of these multifamily operators really get hammered, you know, with their bridge debt, you know, with a lot of them not buying any, you know, interest rate caps and different things like that. But 
for your company as a whole, you know, obviously going through 08 and then now, you know, obviously, you know, there was a ton of syndicators that got started the last two or three years where almost you could go buy any property, you know, and, you know, you put 50K into the deal, you know, you're giving someone that 2X equity multiple after a year or two, where I feel like in the last, you know, maybe year or so, you know, as interest rates have risen, you know, maybe a little steeper than what, you know, the majority of us expected. How has your company sort of, you know, navigated those waters, you know, in the multifamily space, just given that, you know, maybe two or three years ago, it was almost like anyone could buy a multifamily property, you know, and make some money on it. Well, I, and that was the very thing that played right into our strategy is anybody could buy multifamily. And when it gets like that, that's the time to sell them all the multifamily you have. Yeah. So over the last couple of years, we sold every almost everything. We started selling in 2021, and by the middle of 2022, we had sold three quarters of our portfolio. It's over over 3,000 units we sold, and you know that's the thing. The beauty of real estate is there's always an opportunity somewhere, and that's why you'll see a lot of people kind of drifting from one asset class to another and today it's self storage and tomorrow it's hotels and the next day it's offices and you know that that's the beauty of real estate is there you can always find opportunity and that's great if you're uh, using your own money but when you're investing someone else's money you better stick to where your core competency lies and again we found multi to be our core competency and i think that played really well into you know kind of the recent turn of events where we were very entrenched in this industry. We could see the signs and signals very clearly. And it was telling me, while it was telling everybody else get in, it was telling me get out. And, and that's exactly what we did. And now it's, uh, it's been over two years since I've bought a multifamily asset. And I couldn't be happier uh, that it's been that long. And I suspect it may be a while longer before we actually make another acquisition. Uh, I just don't think the market's ready for that yet. And um, we're just waiting for it to get there and come to us. Uh, you know, I, I don't have to chase opportunity in every sector. I've been doing this long enough that now I don't have to do anything <laughs> and, and I can be just fine. Uh, so we only buy when it makes sense to buy. And so that's, that's also been another leg of our strategy is standing down while we watch values fall down. Yeah, and I think that's a great point where I think a lot of, again, operators where, you know, the, maybe the more shady ones, you know, they're coming through and they're just trying to collect the fees, you know, maybe an asset management fee, maybe a finder's fee, whatever that may be. So it's nice to see that your company's coming in. They're not, you're not necessarily like trying to pump out a new property, you know, every single month just to, you know, have a property. And I think an example of that is, is the company, you know, they foreclosed out in Texas, it might've been Houston, you know, it's three or 400 million was wiped out of there. So that's, you know, that's good to see. But just curious, you know, down the road, you know, let's say you do find a multifamily property, you know, whatever it may be, say 50, 100 to 300 units, you know, how do you, you know, really find your investors, you know, they're going to partner alongside you, you know, and invest in that deal? Are you finding them through, you know, doing like podcasts like this and promoting yourself through that? Is it, you know, maybe being an influencer, you know, say on like on, on LinkedIn or, or similar platform, just curious to see like how you, you know, find investors or are you just going like, say more the institutional route, you know, maybe bringing endowment money, you know, over toward you? Yeah, we've certainly done some institutional uh, work, but that's not really our, our core focus. Uh, you know, we we're a boutique investment firm that caters to high net worth individuals and family offices, and that's where our capital comes from more so than from uh, institutional partners, although we've certainly gone down that road before and, you know, we could do it again if the situation were right. Uh, but, you know, in, in the earlier years, I've, I've been doing this for 34 years, and in the earlier years, uh, we used to seek out investors, you know, by any means possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, nowadays, I don't do that anymore. So I don't find my investors, they find me. Uh, you know, people, uh, we've been around long enough that people know who we are and what we do. Uh, we've been around long enough that I have 2000, uh, in, investor relations people. <laughs> and those are, those are our investors who go out and tell their friends and, uh, you know, and their colleagues, uh, Hey, you know, I've invested with these guys. It's been a great experience. You should invest with them. And so people come to us and, and, um, now we, we do zero marketing. 
the only, you know, sir, I, I appear on these podcasts, I think mostly because I just enjoy talking about real estate. Uh, but I suppose at the end of the day, there's people that do find us uh, by hearing uh, us for the first time on a podcast like this. Uh, but, but really, uh, I think as a business matures, it begins to grow organically. And, and we've always grown by word of mouth and referrals. That's always been our primary uh, model. But you know, as the years tick on, that growth uh, gets a lot faster uh, than it does earlier on when you're really trying to build that investor base from nothing. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think it's a good example. And you know, great answer there. You know, it's building up through that referral business. I mean, there's nothing better. You know, as a especially as a you know investor company, you know, you want to get those referrals. You know, if you're not getting referrals, you know, something might be you know wrong. Maybe there's too many capital calls, or you know, something like that. Hopefully, you know, that's never the case. But with that said, like you know, let's say you find that deal in a year. You know, hypothetically, you know, a year from now, you know. Do you even like have to market the deal or is it just like, you know, hey, you know, you're sending it out to your investor relations folks, you know, they know that because, you know, just for your track record, you know, or is it like, do you have to like sell them on the deal? How does that sort of look like when you want to come in or does the deal, you know, get fully funded in, you know, a day or two once you guys finally do find something? Yeah, you know, we used to do single asset syndications where we would find a deal and we would raise money for the deal and, you know, we'd show people, here's the property we're buying and this is the amount of money we're raising. And a lot of those raises were five to $10 million on average. And we would generally fill those up in a, in a couple days and we would do it by just sending out an email to our investor base. We've got another, uh, another property. Here's the specifics. If you're interested, let us know. We'll send you the information and we would send out the information and they could make soft commits. And usually a couple of days later, uh, we were we were fully funded. And then then the, the problem that we had was we had this long line of people that missed mm -hmm. out, you know, and they didn't get in. So we eventually shifted over to a fund model where we would raise money for a fund with a strategy and the strategy would be when we're going to acquire, you know, class A and B multifamily over a hundred units in the Southeastern U S blah, 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 you know, whatever, whatever the particular model was. And that's generally our model, newer uh, properties, newer multifamily properties, mostly in the Southern half of the U S and we, uh, we would send out a notice to our investors that we're opening up this fund. And I think the last fund we did, we raised close to $50 million in about six weeks. Maybe it was a little less than that. And uh, we haven't had to raise since. Now, that this says two things. One is it says that we've done a really good job over the years. We've produced really good results for our investors. That's made people happy. Uh, and as a result, they re invest repeatedly with us. Uh, the, a large, large portion of our capital comes from repeat investors, which is great. It's a great spot to be. So it says that. But it also says that around that time, uh, the real estate market was really hot. Everybody wanted in and investors were investing in every opportunity they could get their hands on. So we can't get complacent as an operator and say that today I could launch a $50 million offering and, and fill it in two or three weeks. Because I don't know that that would actually happen and not because of anything that we've done, but the market has changed. It's different. People might not have as much affinity towards real estate as they did a couple of years ago. There might be a lot of passive investors that invested with other operators that have had challenges such as capital calls, maybe some mortgage defaults, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And that, that creates wounds that, are, uh, that create scars that heal very slowly. And I think you know, down the line, I would expect that we would raise capital slower than we have in the last five or six years. It's gonna be more like it was you know, 10 years ago than it, than like it was two years ago. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And, you know, thinking about, you know, I know you mentioned like the fund model, I'm invested in a couple of deals, you know, some of them, you know, they have four properties in it, you know, some of them, I think one has two, and then you have like a single asset allocation, you know, there's one property in Texas I'm invested in, you know, what's your preference on that? You know, do you like more of that fund model? You know, I know as me as an investor, I almost think of it like an index fund, you know, per se, if you're investing in the stock market, instead of me, you know, investing in one, you know, specific stock, I'm investing in these four different properties. Yeah, the fees might be, you know, they might be a touch higher, you know, maybe a quarter of a percent. But if one property defaults, or, you know, the one I'm thinking of, I'm invested in a triple net lease deal, you know, so there's four different tenants, you know, one of the tenant moves out, they have a vacancy, you know, I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not going to, you know, that cash flow, you know, 
I invested in that deal strictly the cash flow, you know, not a ton of appreciation in a corporate grade A tenant, but curious what your thoughts are on the fund model versus that single, you know, asset allocation. Yeah, I, I prefer the fund model both as an investor and as a sponsor. As a sponsor, a fund gives us more purchasing power. It gives us a, a, a stronger negotiating position when we're acquiring property. Uh, it's easier for us to administer because you know we only have one uh, main accounting vehicle as opposed to you know all these different ones with different tax returns and everything else. It does consolidate a lot of that which is really nice. For the investor, it's kind of like the same reason why you would invest in apartments versus single family homes, right? If one apartment's vacant, you know, you still got 99 other apartments, but in a single family home, if it's vacant, it's vacant. Uh, You know, a fund is kind of the same way. I, I don't care how good an operator is or how long they've been in this business. Everybody has deals that struggle eventually. And so what ends up happening is you've got like, nine deals that are doing great, one deal that's not doing so great, which is typical. And you got nine sets of investors who are really happy and you got one set of investor that's like, you guys are terrible, what's wrong with you guys? Now, of course, if they're invested in across multiple offerings and they see what's going on big picture and they don't feel that way, but if their only investment with you is in that one asset that isn't doing so great, then those investors are kind of like, you know, hey, what's going on, you know? The fund smooths all that out, you know, so the good deals and the, you know, mediocre deals end up in the same vehicle. It's not luck of the draw. You know, I I know investors like to think that we're so skilled that we could pick the winners and not end up investing in the one that struggles. But the reality is you can't. Uh, you don't know which one's going to be the, the difficult one. So if you're investing in a fund, then you get to blend all of that out. It's less risk for you. So I, I, I think investors, passive investors especially, should be looking for ways to uh, minimize single points of failure. So that means if you invest in a fund, you've got multiple properties. If the fund has multiple locations, then you don't have one single location that's a risk. You know, if there was an economic collapse in a city, for example, it's not like it took down all your assets. You know, it's just that's just one of them. Uh, If you invest in funds across a variety of sponsors, you eliminate single sponsor risk. Just anything you can do to try to spread your risk around will give you an investment in real estate as a whole versus an investment in Marvin Gardens. Then Marvin Garden burns down and now your investment went to crap. Yeah, I think that would be a. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I think, too, going back to that, you know, if we could all pick winners, you know, I think we'd all try to get like, you know, 3x equity multiple in five years, <laughs> yeah, you know, triple our money, you know, if we could all do that. But then, you know, speaking of the properties that you're going out and buying, you know, are you going, you know, primarily in like, you know, the Southwest? So like if we're talking like, you know, Texas, Florida, or, you know, Florida, Georgia, you know, Texas is pretty far west from uh, Florida. But yeah, just curious, like the locations you are in, because I've seen some really good deals come across, but they're in California. And it just worries me, you know, it just really worries me investing in those states. Like for me, I'm, you know, I'm primarily in Texas and Kentucky, I think Arkansas, you know, West Virginia, you know, more of your, you know, if you're looking at your political map, more of your red states, you know, more than your blue states, just as they're more, you know, landlord friendly than, you know, like in New York, you know, we're definitely more tenant friendly than we are landlord friendly. You know, it could take a couple of months to evict someone. Just curious, like where, you know, which part of the country, you know, your company really specializes in investing in. Well, in my 34 years, I've owned in California, I've owned in New York, and I've owned in a lot of places in between. So that's a pretty national footprint. Uh, Our current focus right now is on the southern half of the U.S., uh, not California, (laughs) Uh, certainly not New York. Uh, But uh, right now we own in Arizona, uh, Georgia, and Alabama, Uh, but we've had extensive holdings in Texas, Florida, uh, but now we've just, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've sold three quarters of our portfolio. So all that's left is in those states I mentioned. But uh, our, our acquisition targets would be anything from Arizona to Florida and as far north as like Carolinas and Tennessee and anything in between. You know, <clears throat> let's say now, you know, we have someone that's out there you know, they're listening, you know, they like those geographical locations, you know, they've liked what they've heard, you know, now that they've, let's say they become an investor of yours, you know, they've invested with your company, you know, for that potential listener that wants to invest with your company, you know, they they say, hey, this all sounds great. 
how does that sort of that client communication you know sound like on the back end you know we've heard horror stories of you know you invest in a deal and it's super hard to track down the operator or maybe it's a capital raiser that got you into the deal you know that extended arm and then you're having a hard time to hear from them you know luckily for me you know all the deals i'm in you know I either get quarterly or monthly reporting you know and they've been consistent you know for the last couple of years doing that but for your company itself like how often do you communicate you know with the clients or let's say something comes up you know i don't know the, the renovations are taking longer you know the con the the contractor up and left you know and now all of a sudden you know the renovations what you what you thought were going to take six months are going to take nine months do you communicate that you know with the uh with your investors or do you just do that in like a single you know monthly or one off or you know even on all hands call you know i've seen investors do where you know they just bring everyone on a webinar you know or a zoom call you know explain what's going on just curious what that looks like from your company and on the on that client communication aspect of it yeah, you know, it's uh, it's really not uncommon for especially newer and first time sponsors to suffer from massive communication failures and, and uh, complications. And I hear that a lot. It's probably one of the chief investor complaints you'll hear out there in this industry is is lack of communication, especially when things aren't going right. Uh, when things are going wrong, you'll find that I, I, there's like this this course that I always talk about how it's going to go because people will say like, oh, you know, I think that something's going wrong with this deal. And it's like, okay, here's what's going to happen next. You know, you're going to send an email and they're going to put you off. And then uh, when you ask again, they're going to completely ignore you. And then, you know, there's like this whole path that seems to happen. Uh, and and if, if you've been in business long enough, chances are, uh, they're, that company isn't going to have that same problem because you don't last in this business by ignoring your investors. Your investors are your lifeblood. The capital they contribute is the only thing that keeps you going. And if you don't communicate with them, uh, then that's going to be the end of the road. You're going to spend all your time looking for new investors instead of cultivating the relationships you already have. So I'm a big believer in reporting and communications. I remember one time somebody uh, that's a very active um, a passive investor and had started a group uh, that supports passive investors had once written an article about us uh, calling us the gold standard for <laughs> investor reporting and asked if they could publish our reports uh, in their uh, in their stuff so that they could show other sponsors how they're supposed to do it of course we said no uh, you know, they, go let them, you know, invent their own proprietary methods of communication. I fully support growth in this industry and, and people doing a better job, but I don't need everybody out there just copying our stuff. Uh, we, we tend to issue <clears throat> extraordinarily detailed reports. I think our last quarterly, and we do them quarterly, but our last quarterly report for one of our funds was something like 15 pages long or something. I mean, it was really, really extensive, and, and most of that's narrative. Uh, we talk about all sorts of things that's happening at the property level, the fund level, the macroeconomic picture, uh, just all sorts of information. Uh, you know, we provide comparisons between projected performance and actual performance. And when things aren't going according to plan, we say things aren't going according to plan. And here's why. And here's what we're going to do about it if we can do anything at all. Like right now, things aren't going according to plan because the market's terrible. And there's nothing we can do about that. We can't do anything about rising insurance rates. We can't do anything about runaway interest rates. We can't do anything about the fact that no one's out there acquiring anything and the markets come to a standstill. We can't fix those things. But what we can do is we can show our investors how we were prepared for that already and why that isn't a big risk to us and, uh, and, and why uh, impacts to property cash flow could mean... Uh, massive trouble or might not mean massive trouble depending upon how you structured the deal to begin with and then we point out how we structured it to make sure that these kinds of things weren't a massive impact to us so uh, we don't want investors hearing about things on the news so when we've had like buildings burned down it's like you know we send out an email like hey the building burned down yesterday and you know and here's what we're going to do and we've already hired a public adjuster and we're filing an insurance claim and so on and so forth because uh, we don't want them to somebody call up and say like hey i saw this newspaper article you know that mentioned the apartments we own burned down why didn't you tell me uh we, we don't we certainly don't want that so uh, always communicate uh the bad news especially with investors and um 
but also uh, make sure you're communicating regularly with the good news. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good example. I think definitely having like, you know, not that everyone has to do a 15 page, but I mean, you know, I guess if that's gold standard, that's what we should all be striving for. I know as you know, myself as an investor and, you know, hopefully most investors out there, you know, when they're getting into a deal, <clears throat> you know, they're reading the PPM, you know, so that, I mean, that's a lot, probably a lot more intense than the, uh, than the quarterly report that you're sending out. So that's great that you're doing that. But then let's say, you know, someone's in the audience, you know, I guess they're trying to get over that last hump. You know, I know for me personally, you know, your company sounds great. The track record speaks for itself. But just one last little bit of, you know, why should someone invest with your company over, say, another operator within the space? Well, I think uh, most people invest with us for a couple of reasons. One is because we've been around so long, we've proven that we know what we're doing. Uh, the second reason is, is we have a highly experienced team. You know, our, our senior leadership here has 106,000 units of multifamily experience. I don't think you can find that anywhere. Even if you went to Blackstone, you'd have to put together like a, a whole cadre of their uh, of leadership team to add it all together to get to that. Uh, but here we've got four guys uh, who are at the top of the leadership on operations here uh, that have 100, over 100,000 units of experience, and, and that means a lot. Uh, I think the other thing is, is we prioritize risk over return. If people don't invest with us because we're going to have the highest projected return. If that's what you're looking for, uh, you're not going to find it here. Uh, and you're probably not going to find the actual performance that you're seeking with who you do choose, if that's how, if that's your criteria. Uh, but, you know, we, we like to prioritize risk and um, uh, over, over reward. And that's worked well for us in all the years I've been doing this. We've never lost a nickel of investor principal, and and that's you know what how many hundreds of millions that we've raised from investors, and we've never issued an unplanned capital call. Knock on wood. So I, I think for those reasons, you know, track record, experience, uh, integrity, and um, uh, just operational skill, and and structuring our deals to survive adverse market cycles by not taking on too much debt not over leveraging, having plenty of cash reserves, a deep balance sheet, and also a leadership team that doesn't have to transact uh, just to keep the lights on uh, are, are probably the reasons why we've been as successful as we have. Yeah, that's awesome. I really like that risk versus reward. I know for me as an investor, it kind of scares me or sometimes I'll be speaking to someone and they'll be like, you know, the IRR will be like, you know, 45% per year. And we're talking maybe <laughs> class A, you know, class A property. And I'm like, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, that's terrifying for me, you know, where, you know, I'm just looking for a standard, you know, you know, overall, you know, at the end of five years, 10 to 14%, maybe get a standard 8%, you know, pref, you know, just something simple like that. I know I run away when I see an investor give me a deal, you know, and it just sounds too good. Like one guy, he was promising like, you know, Christmas bonuses, you know, another guy, it was in an oil and gas field where there was like, you know, 200% carbon depreciation recapture. I was like, that sounds way too good to be true. Unfortunately, his thing ended up being a Ponzi scheme. So it does, you know, sounds too good to be true. It, it probably is. So I'm, I'm right there with you. I'd rather have a little bit less risk, you know, be a little bit more standard than trying to jump for the fences, you know. And again, we're talking like class A, you know, maybe class D, you know, class C, you know, heavy value add. Maybe you could get that at the end of the deal, but... Yeah. Oh, that, that all sounds great. And then Brian, last question of the day is, you know, if our audience is interested in learning more about you or learning more about our, your company, where can they find you? Uh, they can find us on our website uh, for Praxis Capital. The website is praxcap.com. It's P-R-A-X-C-A-P.com. You can also find me on Instagram at Investor Brian Burke. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. I'll make sure to include that on the show notes on our website. And thank you again for coming on to the show today. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate it.